Welcome to Crimson Guitars. Welcome to my current home workshop. And this is, this is a guitar. This is something else. This is a 1954 Gretsch 6120T. And it is the 14th one off the production line ever. It is a significant guitar. It is incredibly cool. And uh, as is often the case with uh, Gretsch's of this era, it needs a neck reset, so, well, I'm going to do that here. The level crown polish, all of that sort of stuff, that will be done at headquarters uh, after I've woven my magic. Going into them without a slight sense of trepidation is not necessarily advisable, so we'll see how it goes. Oh, by the way, to digress, this guitar is currently, I think, at the time of filming, for sale. So, yeah, if you have a uh, spare £27,500 floating around, check it out. I would love to have it for the museum, but uh, yeah, that's not going to happen this time around. There's just something about opening up an instrument of this uh, vintage and quality that just never gets old and it's not about the guitar itself necessarily it's about the history of the guitar and the feel and what it has done so here we go the patina the just sheer beauty the age uh, I do love the old nitro finishes because of how it ages how natural it feels uh, it, it makes all the difference, uh, in my opinion. Uh, obviously the inlays and they're all engraved, etc. Uh, aluminium nut. People think that, people think that aluminium is this uh, sort of ultra-modern, brand new uh, stuff, and it's just not. The first aluminium guitar, the first aluminium guitar was made pre-1900, uh, within, I think, a decade of uh, us figuring out an efficient way of processing aluminium, uh, a, a cheap and efficient way. So yeah, all of these people saying aluminium guitars, way of the future, new, amazing, etc. It's not actually quite factually correct. This Bigsby has been re-gold plated, but uh, I think other than that, everything is uh, as original, basically. Uh, I personally do like the patination and the, and the feel and the, the sense of age that you get from the, the worn down uh, plating. A branded logo, it's part of the look, proper f holes, etc. Now here you can see what the issue is. We've got a bottomed out bridge, a basically playable action, but uh, it isn't where it should be. So the extension here, the fretboard extension, uh, is entirely off the top of the guitar and uh, the, the tenon ends, or the dovetail ends, underneath this fret. So I'm going to remove the strings and remove that fret and drill in on the end of the tenon. And then I will use a foam cutting tool available at an Amazon near you. This rod heats up and that's going to warm up the whole uh, joint. I'm liking all of these tools and things that are available easily to us now uh, that can be repurposed for guitar building. So yeah, check it out. Would you look at that? Uh, there's a couple of spots where it might have been glued in, but that's uh, that's interesting. And that's all moved and uh, discombobulated. There's a bit of a repair to go on under there as well. Okay, don't forget that that pops out. And that your bridge moves. I'm going to be fiddling around with this quite a lot, so I'm going to take the whole Bigsby off and uh, I'll just set it aside. Same thing with the bridge. We don't uh, don't want things floating around unnecessarily. I like the uh, threaded insert mechanism here and uh, 
Well, center line? What center line? There will be your ground. The binding and the inlay material is fairly delicate on these old things. And I don't want to slip. Hell, I don't even necessarily feel comfortable talking when I do this. All I have is this uh, very, very old, very early uh, Crimson Guitar thread puller. I do not know where my current one is. I'm not liking the feel of that, so I'm going to get the fret end cutters, which have got a much sharper cut. Now I'm pushing down on the grain and then compressing, which is keeping the grain that is trying to pull up, and some of it is, uh, in position. There we go. I'm trying to gauge where the edges of the uh, the tenon up. Not the easiest thing to see from here. And then I'm going to start the drilling with a shorter drill bit and with a 120 year old drill because why not? And this is to stop when I've got a longer bit. Uh, the bit potentially wandering around and doing some damage. If you go full bore in forward, uh, you, uh, you do tend to rip things out and cause uh, chips and cracks and all sorts of nonsense. So uh, whenever I'm making a hole bigger, that already exists, I tend to start in reverse so I can see and feel what's going on. Obviously the bit doesn't cut as much, or as fast, or as viciously, and that is the point. No mess, no fuss, no chips, no problem. Obviously with my long bit, I want to go very deep. I want to spread the heat evenly throughout the entire dovetail. I really don't want to go through the back. I do not want to do that. most of the way there. Remember the uh, the neck actually ends before the binding starts, so we're good. This drill bit is a fraction larger than the other one, so again in reverse when I start and then gently. Yes, that was frightening. I can hear and feel that I'm hitting a shim of some sort. God, that sounds nasty. Yep, it's a fairly tight fit. Uh, but that's because of this crimp at the end, so I'm going to just file that off. If I'd gone any bigger, you would see these drill holes on either side of the fret. And we're not going... This is a repair that people expect on these guitars. And in fact, pay extra for because it means it's going to be a, a better, more playable instrument. Uh, much as when you're visiting somebody's house 
try to leave it tidier than when you left. We don't want any, uh, I don't know, steaming dumps left on the bedspread, for example. Yes, that's a reference to a news article I read the other day about, funnily enough, a newspaper mandate. M mandate. A newspaper magnate. Keeping these metal shavings well away from the pickups. Et voila. Of course, I've got two. Now, if this joint doesn't like doesn't feel like it's going to give give way, then uh, I will inject a little bit of water into these cavities. But uh, yeah, that's not my first order of business. Get some power on. I can feel the heat radiating already. So that heat is going to be filling up that aforementioned air gap and this is going to work slower than uh, uh, I had hoped. I'm just going to put this underneath the heel and uh, which will give me something to gently push against. Do you know what we've come to? We've come to the really scary bit. All right, syringe, needle. Let's get some water in there. Don't want to set fire to a guitar, do we? Two may well be overkill. I'm going into the corner. I'm not pushing, I'm being very gentle. There's going to be a tiny amount of touch-up work after this. I've got some forward movement. I've got some backward movement. It feels like it's holding in the middle somewhere and it just shouldn't be because I see no evidence of a screw unless they've got it somehow internally through the neck block which would suck suck I tell you We're nearly there. Yeah, we are nearly there. Okay, so I'm going to put a little bit of, uh, I need to put a little bit more welly into it. And uh, my jig is built and set up around a non-cutaway guitar. However, utilizing a couple of violin spool clamps, uh, I can achieve the same result. I just need to put a little bit of positive upwards pressure in the right place and I will be but ah, she's gonna give right on the edge where the guitar is nice and nice and stable and essentially I'm gonna be pushing against these things Okay, so gently put two spool clamps. They've got cork on there. It's safe. And this little bit of scrap uh, tool rack, which is currently being unused. Moving quickly now, I can still feel it's all nice and warm. There we go. Just one last tiny little bit of give somewhere in there. 
Where were you? This is a story of having, an, having adjustable jigs, having things that will do the job, no matter the shape of the instrument, really. But uh, yeah, I'm happy with that. So let's, uh, while this is all still warm, uh, clean her up a little bit. This, that, the underside of this, not been seen since 1954, uh, which is pretty cool. Obviously, my two holes, perfectly placed, but uh, went straight into a gap. Hmm. The back of this bit of wood here uh, has got a, a three millimeter gap in the middle. It's, it's absolutely, well, you wouldn't want that much relief in your, uh, in your truss rod, I tell you. One chunky old piece of veneer installed on that side. One chunky old, not straight at all, in any way, shape or form, piece of veneer in there. So, time to clean off that gunk and go in here. Obviously, this is the original neck. Uh, you can see just the sheer amount of gappage around the back. That was where the veneer was glued. And just, just air gaps. Air gaps. Ha! Hold on. Is that... I think we've actually got another two pieces of veneer. Yeah, that's not, that's not excess veneer left from these pieces because they're still there. Um, there's more veneer on the sides of these pieces here. So there's gonna be some work rebuilding this damn thing. Center line, hello, where are you? Uh, I mean, on the guitar itself, at least the visible section. Well, now that I know I'm looking for it, you can see that that's not quite centered, uh, especially up there. I didn't notice it really until we get to here. Uh, what the hell? It's a, it's a visual thing. It's not, no, never mind. Meh, just huge gaps. And then you can see that's, that's the flap there. And have a look at how dished that is. That's flat, that's the angle. Flat, that's how dished it is. But because this instrument is made out of uh, essentially veneers, as they've clamped it on there, this whole edge has actually got a bit of a curve now to it. It's, it's pushed in and, and done its thing, so it does work. And there's an argument here against how perfectionist uh, we are in guitar building these days. We, if, if there's the tiniest gap in our inlays, we, we cry ourselves to sleep all the time. Um, if, it, if, you, if a joint isn't absolutely spot on, don't beat yourself up. Guitars of this era were not built to that level of quality. Guitars made by Gibson are not built to that level of quality. Of course, I'm going to rebuild this up and make it better than it ever was. But in doing so, am I taking away some of that mojo? Perhaps? Maybe. Let me know what you think in the comments. So my original vain forlorn hope was that uh, I would get this done in one episode and it would be fine. But um, looking at what I've got here, I've got to, a lot of building up to do, a lot of, I don't think I've got a square straight edge in the entire thing. That means this is just turned into a two-parter and you're gonna have to come back in a few days for the next episode. Thanks for watching, click like, subscribe and uh, Hey, welcome me back, yo. No, I, I, I said I start say yo, pretending to be cool, uh, ironic.